Hello and welcome to our talk about the spawn survey in the New Forest. To start off with, I thought I'd give you a bit of background about who we are as the Freshwater Habitats Trust. This is a picture of our team and within this team, there are four of us that work directly in the New Forest. Our aim as a charity is to protect all freshwater life for everyone forever. We are a strongly evidence-based conservation charity because we were set up by academics from Oxford Brookes universities after identifying that there was a research gap around ponds. So we started off as Pond Action back in the late 1980s, but later became Freshwater Habitats Trust in 2013 as we are concerned about biodiversity loss in all of Britain's freshwaters. With this strong scientific grounding, our work is highly strategic as we target locations based on evidence and where the evidence suggests it will be most effective. As part of this strategic working, we work a lot in partnership. So this is with people and communities. So we've run volunteer citizen science projects, one of which in the New Forest is the Water Blitz and the Spawn Survey. And then we also work with organisations. So we are co-hosts of the Catchment Partnership in the New Forest, working with the National Park Authority. And we work in these partnerships to get the best results for freshwater wildlife. And just to emphasise as well, we are concerned about all freshwaters. So that is from the small to the large. So we care about even those trackway pools and kind of puddles that may get over, overlooked as they only appear seasonally in winter. From source to sea, the new forest is recognised globally as important with areas designated under the Ramsar Convention as wetlands of international importance due to their biodiversity and uniqueness. The new forest is bursting with ancient, fragile, rare wildlife. There's a couple of stats here for you. So 30% of the threatened freshwater species can be found in the new forest. And 65% of all native wetland plants can be found there, with 30% of all native freshwater invertebrates. So that just gives you an idea of the biodiversity that it holds. And this is in part due to all of the many different habitats that the New Forest contains, with a selection shown there in the pictures. Each of these habitats are all semi-natural, as the history of the landscape means there has been less modification and unrecoverable change than other areas of lowland Britain. However, the area is still very fragile and any changes could have vast negative impacts on the biodiversity. This slide gives you a flavour of some of the amazing diversity that the new forest holds. So the tadpole shrimp is an amazingly rare species that can be found in only two locations, the new forest and up in Scotland. It is one of the oldest species on earth with similar fossils dating back 200 million years and it has managed to survive by living in temporary ponds with very low nutrients and very few predators or competitors. Equally on this slide, there is marsh club moss, which is not a true moss, but a primitive non-flowering plant more closely related to ferns. The club mosses form part of a group that remain virtually unchanged from when they first evolved 400 million years ago. So again, another ancient rare species that is still living in the new forest. Pond mud snails there in the corner are a small freshwater species that were once widespread in the UK, but have been declining over 25 years. And they can live in a range of different freshwater habitats. And where, they're still where they have declined in the UK, they're still thriving in the new forest. Now let's go into some of the reasons that we still have this amazing biodiversity and the first of those two reasons is because of the management and the grazing that happens over the new forest. So the heavy hoofed animals of the commoners, ponies and cattle 
play a really important role as architects of the New Forest, with their footprints shaping the landscape, especially when it comes to water environments, as those footprints will break up plant communities and create space and bare ground for new different plants to potentially colonise. The early colonising plants tending to be some of the rare species. Also, so on the previous slide, there was coral necklace. Coral necklace relies on there being disturbance um, to outcompete different plants. The other important thing these grazing animals do is they cycle nutrients around. So it's very low nutrient in the heathlands and the sort of mires and many of the environments in the new forest. And the livestock will build up those nutrients as they eat a variety of plants. And then where they poo will be a nice little concentration of those nutrients to support plants to grow there at very low natural levels. So their dynamic of grazing and pooing cycles and moves around nutrients, allowing for different plants to thrive again. And as you build up the biodiversity of plants, you build up the biodiversity of invertebrates and the biodiversity of invertebrates supports the biodiversity of predators on them. So it's all baseline and building itself up. So the second reason the freshwater biodiversity is so high in the New Forest is because of clean water. By clean water, I'm saying that there are low natural levels of nutrients. So in 2016, we did a national study called Clean Water for Wildlife, where we would use test kits to get results of nitrates and phosphates from different water bodies. On this slide, you can see the results from the op catchment that had about 675 samples taken across the catchment. And it was found that 60% of those were highly polluted, 10% had some pollution and 30% were clean. So this is a characteristic of a normal UK lowland catchment. And now if we compare that to the new forest. You can see here that the picture is very different with 74% of the results being clean. And that just gives you an idea of how all of these different species can thrive. It's because there is clean water in the whole variety of habitats that the new forest holds. This year, we have been running the Water Blitz, which has been a repeat of the Clean Water for Wildlife study, however, just in the New Forest. And we have come back with very similar results, with it being 80% clean from the locations that we have tested so far. This just really highlights that importance for clean water, with some nutrient pollution resulting in the specialist species being crowded out by more pollutant tolerant species, which will be commonly found across the UK. Now I just wanted to give you a bit of an overview of the projects that we've been running for the last 18 months to give you a flavour of what we are doing to protect and conserve this amazing freshwater landscape. So the first of those projects is Woodlands and Wetlands. This has been funded by the Green Recovery Challenge Fund and has had the aim to expand the freshwater network and then also do some restoration work in some woodlands to bring light down to the springs and flushes that can be found there. We have created two new wetlands during this project at the edges working with private landowners and contractors. We've also done quite a lot of invasive species remover as part of this project again working with contractors and volunteers to do this work. If you want to find out more about this project do go on our website where there is more information. So the other main project that we have had running this year is called Wilder for Water and this project has all been focused on engaging with local and visitors to the New Forest as one of the key pressures 
that the new forest faces is visitor pressure, as this is where lots of little impacts can build up when done by lots of people to have a real significant impact on the landscape. So this project again was funded by the Green Recovery Challenge Fund. And as part of this, we have been promoting our new forest water code, which is a set of sort of best practice behaviours about when you visit the new forest to limit your impact on the new forest landscape. So on the left side of the slide here, it says clean water for wildlife. And these are three messages that are really focusing on keeping the water clean. So leave no trace is the traditional take your litter home but then it also goes a bit beyond that to think about not using the new forest as a toilet facility and actually taking all of our waste that we can so using toilets and equally taking any pet waste home or disposing of it within a suitable bin and use suitable facilities is similar in the idea that if you have any wastewater, not tipping that onto the new forest, but actually really making sure that it goes down a suitable drain. Um, and the new forest is so fragile and pristine as a landscape, that actually even tap water has the power to change the water chemistry and actually impact the plant communities that the new forest holds. So even that bit of tap water that we might be giving our dog or the little bit of tea at the end of a mug can really build up if it's a repeat action by lots of different people. So if we lead by example and make sure that we dispose of any kind of wastewater down, down a drain, then we are doing our bit. And the last message on there is check clean dry which is a message that focuses on invasive species. So if you're coming to the new forest from any area or live in the new forest, have visited somewhere else and are coming back, it's really important to clean off any kit that you have been using, as these can transport diseases, pests and invasive species. And it is just using that simple check, clean and dry method. And then on the other side of this leaflet, we have messages about disturbance to wildlife and how we can limit that. So doing the right activity in the right place, knowing actually that it's best to go to those outdoor activity centres or maybe the country parks to do certain activities, always following the signs and instructions that are posted around on trails, just to make sure that we are doing the right activity in the right place. And the second one is sticking to the to the pitch so the new forest is not suitable for wild camping because of the impacts that wild camping can have on the forest as the forest does not have the suitable facilities to meet your needs um, and then the last one is on the right track and that's thinking about keeping dogs under effective control and also cycling on the cycle routes and walking on the footpaths just to limit the air of disturbance and just by following these simple simple actions that most of you probably follow anyway we limit our impact leaving nothing behind and taking nothing away except for love of the forest so now we will get on to the project you are all here to hear about the spawn survey which is a national survey that the Freshwater Habitats Trust run every single spring to collect records on frog and toad breeding. We ask volunteers to just keep their eyes out as they take their walks across the new forest and any area and then report any sightings of frog or toad spawn. And now I will pass you over to my colleague Anne to tell you a bit more about frogs and toads. As Thea has mentioned, as part of this project, we'd like volunteers to carry out amphibian surveys, with the emphasis being on looking for toads and frogs and their spawn. So I'll kick off with an introduction to toads and frogs. I knew a bit about the common toad. 
Despite its name, the common toad is no longer as common as it once was, and toads are now considered at-risk species, protected by law from sale and trade, and they are now classed as priority species for conservation. Toad numbers have reduced significantly over the last few decades. Although the reasons for this are not clear, road mortality, climate change and habitat loss could all be contributory factors. a wide range of habitats, particularly open woodland, hedgerows, grassland and gardens. Toads are more tolerant of dry conditions than frogs and newts and can be found far from water outside the breeding season, especially on heathland, moorland and on cliff sea cliffs. They prefer to breed in lakes or gravel pits, but will also use park, park or large garden ponds and, and occasionally canals or slow flowing rivers. Because common toads are less prone to fish predation than common frogs, populations can, can exist in waters inhabited by fish. On land, often in old rodent burrows, burrows, which can be some distance from water, the springtime migration to their breeding ponds, often the ponds in which they were born, usually take place after dark on damp evenings in March. This often results in many toads being killed by cars in areas where a road crosses their migration route. They congregate in their breeding ponds in large numbers, with males often forming mating balls as they compete for females. Spawning takes place at night and jet black tadpoles usually emerge from the eggs within two weeks. and widespread amphibian, the common frog. The common frog population in the wider countryside declined dramatically during the latter half of the 20th century, mainly due to the agricultural intensification and the loss of farmland ponds. Garden ponds have, have been somewhat a saviour for the species. Populations thrive in suburban and semi-rural residential areas where the species' powers of dispersal uh, have helped them survive, with newly constructed ponds often being quickly colonised. Frogs can be found in a large range of damp habitats, including woodland, damp grassland, hedgerows, moorlands, parks, gardens and uplands, habitats up to about 1,000 metres. Whilst they typically breed in small, shallow ponds and the margins of larger lakes, common frogs also use ditches, puddles or slow flowing waters. They are opportunistic breeders and unlike toads, they are not faithful to their breeding birthplace. To hibernate in damp conditions, either close to water or submerged in the mud at the bottom of a pond, absorbing sufficient oxygen through their skin to survive. They breed as soon as they emerge from habitation, hibernation, typically in late February and early March. Common frogs are also described as quite explosive breeders as they create quite a commotion in their breeding ponds for a week or two, with many croaking males visible at the surface. However, as spawning is over, the frogs quickly disperse. Spawn is laid in the shallowest, sunniest part of the pond and tadpoles emerge, emerge from it within two weeks. Look at identifying toads, frogs and their spawn in more detail. first at frog spawn, which tends to appear in the pond first. I'm sure that you're all familiar with frog spawn, but to recap, frogs lay round spawn clumps of up to 2,000 eggs, each black with a lighter patch underneath, enclosing a sphere of jelly, as you can see here. Together, the individual clumps formed can form a single conjoined mat as each individual frog will lay one clump it's impossible it is possible to estimate how many frogs are breeding in the pond so looking at this photo it looks like there are three clumps so three female breeding frogs 
been made a bit easier to count with rings around them. It takes a bit more time, but it's possible to determine the number of individual clumps. If you are able, it can actually be worth taking a photograph like this and counting them up at home. But please be aware, though, that when they are first laid, they are quite tight and then spread out with age. So it can be quite tricky to count them. Don't worry, though, on the recording form, we'll ask you to count the clumps in batches. So, for example, 2 to 5, 6 to 10, 11 to 20 and so on, right up to 2001 plus. So we just really want an idea of how many. So for this example, we can see 15 clumps. So this can be recorded as 11 to 20. And I'll tell you a bit more about the survey form uh, later on in the presentation. So it shows spawn as it starts to develop. So you can see the little black specks are the, um, the, tad the tadpoles just starting um, to come out. And here again, <coughs> this shows that this, they still see the outline of, of the, the jelly with the tadpoles forming in the centre. The more photographs of tadpoles really starting to develop. Toad spawn. So toads lay spawn in strings, which are often wound around aquatic vegetation and have double alternating rows of eggs with each string on average containing 1,500 eggs. But don't worry, for toad spawn, we're only asking you to record the present absence as it's pretty impossible to count. And you can see from this photograph as well, on the right-hand side, we can see with, there is some frog spawn there, so that gives you a little bit of scale. Up ...of toad spawn. showing frog and toad spawn again laid together. So you can see that quite often frogs and toads do coexist with frogs, um, frogs laying first and then the toads following on. So let's have a look at toad and frog tadpoles. Although, although during their early stages, common frog and common toad tadpoles look very similar, once they start to grow, they become very different in coloration. So frog tadpoles develop bronze spots, whereas the toad tadpoles remain very dark, almost black, right through the tadpole stage. So common frog tadpoles are usually larger than toad tadpoles, but as there is a great deal of variation in growth rates between individuals, body size is not a reliable distinguishing feature. So you can see here the, the frog tadpole on the left, very lovely and big and mottled, and the very dark um, almost black uh, toad tadpole on the right. Yeah, of common frog and toad tadpoles is actually very different. So common frog tadpoles tend to stay hidden amongst vegetation and detritus, and common toad tadpoles are distasteful to many predators and hence swim about in open water, sometimes in great numbers, forming shoals. And large numbers of black tadpoles swimming in shoals are likely to be common toad. And tadpoles usually spend between 15 and 25 weeks in the water. Toad, toad tadpoles shawling. You can see here on this pond the dark mass on the far shore. On closer inspection, it is revealed that there is a mass of thousands of toad tadpoles. So there is no mistaking here that this is a significant toad breeding pond. And here we have a, an underwater photograph of some of those toad tadpoles all mingling um, in the warmth of the corner of the uh, pond. So moving on to adults. <clears throat> The common toad, as I've said, is quite a familiar animal, so there is little chance of confusing it with anything else. The only real challenge is distinguishing common toad tadpoles from those of common frogs when they are newly hatched, as we've already seen. But to recap, if you're unsure, toads have rough, warty skin, so are readily identifiable from common frogs. When moving, they tend to, to walk rather than hop like frogs. And they have wonderful bronze eyes with elliptical uh, pupils, as you can see here. 
frog is also a familiar animal, but unlike toads, they have smooth skin and are relatively athletic, leaping rather than walking like toads. And this species shows a range of variation in coloration and markings. And unlike toads, frogs' eyes are much rounder pupils, as you can see here. And this is a male. You can see it's got very chunky forearms. Amphibians can show considerable variation in coloration and common frogs can be particularly variable. So in a single population, there can be a great variation in coloration and markings. Amphibians can also change coloration to a certain extent according to the background illumination and brightness. But funny coloured frogs, especially from garden ponds, inevitably turn out to be common frogs. The common frog is a familiar animal and the only likely identification um, stems from unusual coloured marked individuals, as we have seen. There are some uh, native and non-native frogs established in England. However, these non-native breeds, these non-natives breed in the late spring, early summer and call loudly. So any frogs breeding early in the spring are almost certainly common frogs. We can see the warty chunky toad on the left hand side compared to the smooth skinned athletic frog on the right hand side. Frogs can get confused themselves. So here we have a common toad attempting to have a special cuddle with a common frog. The photo does however highlight the difference in eye coloration. The toad on top has a wonderful golden eye with a very elongated pupil whereas the frog below has very round pupils and should look somewhat, look somewhat startled given the circumstances. So this pair should have gone to Specsavers. So for the spawn survey, we'd like volunteers to keep an eye out for signs of frogs and toads whilst they are out and about. It's from February to May. Although timing depends a lot on where you are in the country, for this year's spawn survey, we had the first sightings on the 23rd of December from the Scilly Isles, and not long after, some sightings in the New Forest. If you have a, a local pond, it's always worth making several visits, if possible, throughout this time. There is a pond that I monitor every year for amphibians, and the frogs turn up first, followed by the toads. I have visited this pond the second weekend in March and found lots of frog activity and large clumps of frog spawn, but just a handful of toads milling around in the water. A week later, I have revisited and found that the frogs have largely gone, but there's still loads of spawn, and the pond was full of literally dozens of toads and lots of toad string. So basically, we are asking you you during the day to walk around the edge of the pond searching for signs of amphibians. Record any sightings of an amphibian at the pond and count the number of frog clumps and the presence of toad spawn. If you undertake the survey slightly after the main spawning period, you can also look out for tadpoles or newt larvae. On the approach to the pond, it's amazing what you can see if you approach quietly. And you can also look under refugia, which is where these toads were found. Signs of toads and frogs. You can record any amphibians you see whilst undertaking the survey. Now, please be aware the amphibian survey time overlaps with ground nesting bird season. So it's important to stay on track during this time to limit disturbance. So please do adhere to any forestry signs that you see. So a serious problem, especially in wetlands. So it's important to follow basic uh, biosecurity guidance, the check, clean and dry. You need to carry out the survey can be found on our web page, including an update of the spawn survey in the New Forest. So the first button will take you to the recording form, which you can download. It's very simple. You just need to record basic details 
of what you've seen. And don't forget uh, to add the recording group as a new forest, as you can see here in green. <clears throat> as this is part of a national survey, when you come to submit your records, uh, the results from across the country uh, end up in one data set. So it just makes it easier for us to pin down the records from the new forest area. Your findings on the recording form and you are back home, you can then upload these onto the data portal, which is just just below the resource button on the web page. Enter all the basic information like your name, email, address, date and survey and grid references and add again the new forest as the group name to help us filter the results. The button will take you to a very handy ID guide which you can download. Now this is courtesy of our friends Amphibian and Reptile Conservation. And finally, the third button takes you to a handy document that will help you find a good reference. If you are recording from a garden pond, then you can use your postcode. But for ponds in the wider countryside, ideally, we would like a good reference so we can map your record accurately. Things come in, we update our map on the new Forest Spawn Survey 2023 web page. The light blue squares indicate areas where spawn has been spotted in the past. The blue spots are this year's sightings of frog spawn so far and the red dots toad spawn. We aspire to have a record from each one kilometre grid square of the forest. So if you see a blank on the map, maybe it's worth a visit. If you could share your photos with us on social media. Or if you don't use social media, you can email them to Thea and she can share them. And don't forget to use the hashtag spawn survey on any tweets or, or um, shares that you carry out. So we've looked at the differences between frogs and toads and their spawn and talked about the project resources and how to upload your data. So let's look at the other amphibians you may come across in your pond, namely newts. Three species of native newt in the UK, the great crested newt, which is a big chapper on the top on this illustration, the smooth newt, which is at the bottom uh, of this illustration, and in the middle, our smallest native newt, the palmate. Identify adult newts, it's easiest to focus on males during the breeding season when the development of courtship features makes them readily distinguishable. This is a male smooth newt. The male in the breeding season spots a dorsal crest which runs from head to tail tip with no break. They grow up to about 10 centimetres and, and they have a belly which is orange, has an orange central band with black spots. They also have smooth skin although it looks soft and velvety looking during, ter during the terrestrial phase. The largest of our native newts growing up to 15, 16 centimetres in length. And on paper, the male great crested newt, which is the one at the top, has some characteristics in common with the smooth newt in that they both have crests and orange bellies with black spots. This can lead to smooth newts being misreported as great crested newts. But on closer inspection, the two species are very different in appearance. The crest of the great crested newt is usually more ragged than the smooth newt, and it is a distinct break at the base of its tail. Other features of the male great crested newt include a silvery white stripe along the sides of the hind end of the tail. The female has an orange stripe along the hind end of the tail. And the orange, the, and sorry, the female has an orange stripe along the hind uh, end of the tail. And both have rough black granular skin, although they can look chocolatey brown in torchlight. And another distinguishing feature is a yellow fingertips. So these two newts were photographed while under anaesthesia to photocopy them for a study on individuals within a population. And they were absolutely fine afterwards. 
the palmate newt. In full breeding condition, the male palmate newt does not develop the obvious crest, as in great crested and smooth newts. It has a ridge running along its back, but not a crest. It is also the smallest of our newts. It does, however, develop other features during the breeding season, which help to identify it a tail filament and webbed hind feet. The body is also square shaped in, co in cross section, but this is not as obvious as the two other features. And finally, it has a panel of orange pink down the side of its tail, topped and bottomed by a row of black spots. The tail filament gives the appearance that the tip of the tail has been cut off and replaced with a fine thread. And the hind feet are webbed and the webbing is sooty black. Smooth newt, the male smooth newt in breeding condition, the male smooth newts develop flaps of skin around the toes of the hind feet and in extreme cases gives the impression of webbing, as in the palmate. However, the hind feet of the male smooth newts do not take on the dark, sooty coloration of palmates and the obvious crest of a male smooth newt in peak condition should not allow any confusion of the two species. The female of the smooth and palmate newts. So what if you only find one newt and it's a female? Well, as we've seen, great crested newts are striking as, are as striking as the male and are unlikely to be confused with other species. But female palmate newts and smooth newts can look very similar. If these newts are captured in a net, then close inspection is possible, as we can see in the next slide. When newts are being observed by torchlight, identification may be less easy. So if only females are seen, then in this situation, they should be recorded as small newts. So males of the two species, as we have seen, are easier to tell apart. from smooth newts is on the basis of the coloration of the throat if you happen to have uh, the newt in your hand. It is sometimes said that the female smooth newts have spotted um, throats while there are no spots on the throat of the palmate newt. This holds true in many cases but some female smooth newts also lack spots on the throat as you can see in the central photograph. It is more, more reliable to focus on the background coloration of the throat. In females, smooth newts, the background coloration is off-white or khaki coloured. In palmates, there is no pigmentation on the throat area, uh, giving it a pink coloration due to the blood vessels under the skin. So an easy way to remember it is smooth, S, spotty or straw, and palmate, P, pink. So at night, when you use a torch, uh, this is what they would look like. So what newt am I? Well, these are smooth newts. And you can see the continuous crest of the male on the right hand side. These newts, well, these are palmate newts. You can see uh, the male at the top, you can work, see, you can work, see it's very sooty back hind feet and below is a female and this is a very gravid female so it's probably about ready to lay some eggs. Out is a male great crested newt. So you can see the lovely yellow fingertips and the white flash on the back of the tail. So when they're swimming about in open water, that is something that can quite often grab your eye as they swish about um, in the pond. Great crested newt, not such a brilliant picture, but again, you can see the yellow toenails and you can just about work out the, the yellow flash under the tail. So newts spend most of their lives in terrestrial habitats, returning to ponds to breed in the spring. They tend to do their courting at night, which is why they can be found swimming around more easily after dark. So the female deposits their eggs singly, usually wrapped within folded leaves. 
So here we have a female palmate newt at the top and it's holding a leaf of some water starwort in place around an egg she has recently laid. And she will remain in this position for several minutes, presumably waiting for the adhesive around the eggs to set, holding the leaf in place around it. This egg wrapping behaviour probably serves to protect the eggs from predation and UV. But not all eggs are wrapped up. Sometimes, especially when vegetation is scarce, eggs will be stuck to available surfaces, for example, twigs and pebbles. Active in a pond, you will see signs of egg laying activity by the presence of folded leaves, as you can see here. And the smaller newts often favour float grass. Uh, it's quite difficult to work out on here, but you can, if you look closely, you can see that some of the leaves are actually folded over and the eggs will be laid in the little gaps uh, between the folds. Great crested new eggs are usually more apparent than the eggs of the smaller newts as they tend to be wrapped in larger leaves and are hence more visibly uh, readily visible. So searching for eggs is an excellent method of detecting the presence of great crested newts. And when a folded leaf is found, the egg can be unfolded to allow inspection and identification of the egg inside. Great crested newt eggs are larger than those of smooth and palmates and they tend to be paler in colour, appearing white, sometimes with a hint of green or more rarely orange. And smooth and palmate new eggs are indistinguishable to the naked eye, um, sort of between the two species, and they are quite beige and uh, or grey. So you can see here uh, the photograph on the um, on the right, the great crested newt, very white, and the smooth stroke palmate newt, a lot greyer. A variety of plants, but they do seem to have preferences. Great crested newts tend to select larger leaved plants which make them easier to detect than those of the other two species. In fact, it can sometimes be quite difficult to find eggs for the smaller newts. So plants favoured by great crested newts include float grass, gypsy wort, water forget-me-not and water mint. However, other species will be used if these are not present. If no aquatic plants are around, other material may be used, such as plastic rubbish or terrestrial plants dropping in the water. So we can see the illustration at the bottom here, that's um, some great crested new eggs laid on some hawthorn leaves, which have obviously dangled into the pond. In a good newt pond, it's, it's often possible to see very obvious signs of newt breeding activity. So here you can see multiple eggs laid on one piece of vegetation, water forget-me-not. However, as GCN are a protected species, it is actually illegal to disturb them, so please avoid opening any folded leaves unless you hold a GCN license, as once open they tend not to stick back together. And although we are not specifically searching for GCN as part of this project, it would be interesting to know of any ponds where they may be present. In which case, please do take a photograph and send it over to Thea so that um, it can, the pond can be investigated if you're in the new forest. This is a newly hatched GCN larvae. During the early development stages, newt larvae can be difficult to differentiate between. They are well grown. It is relatively easy to distinguish great crested newt larvae from the other two species. Although palmate newt and smooth newt larvae cannot reliably be distinguished in the field in the same way that the eggs are too similar to the naked eye. At about the same time the supply of new eggs begins to tail off, larvae should be sufficiently well grown to allow identification. And great crested newt larvae grow, in, grow to a large size than palmate and smooth newt, up to about 5 cm, compared to up to about 3 cm in the smaller newts. However, due to the prolonged period of egg laying in um, newts, larvae can range in ages, so a small larvae may simply be more recently hatched. It's more reliable to identify great crested newts on the basis of the morphology and coloration. And also, great crested newts have very long toes. Large gills arching over the head 
and a broad spotty tail fin with a filament at the tip. They also have very black ringed iris, a bit like a uh, bad goth, goth makeup. And they also tend to float out in the water, open water, preying on water fleas, etc. And this behaviour, of course, makes them incredibly vulnerable, which is why they cannot coexist happily with fish. Newts. As I mentioned previously, for this survey, we are not asking you to look specifically for newts, but just to record any that you may see. Newts are most active at night, so there's a good chance that you may not come across any during the daytime search. But smooth newts can often be seen swimming around the pond in daylight hours. GCN less often. GCN are also are a protected species, so you do need a license from Natural Link to actively search for them. So during your daytime search, you are most likely to come across signs of egg laying. So if you see these, please again, do take photographs and send them over to Thea. For conservation, the Surrey Amphibian Reptile Group and the New Forest Ecological Consultants, Fred Home and Phil King for the use of their resources and photographs in this presentation. Now well equipped to get out into the new forest and go on a spawn hunt.